Well, please join me in opening uh, the Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one from under seats nearby you. And 1 Peter is one of the last books of the Bible, so all the way uh, toward the end. And as you uh, walked in this morning, you received um, a booklet uh, called Jesus and um, Politics. So if you didn't grab one of these, you, uh, there's some copies still at the uh, Resource Center um, available. So um, we, this is not a comprehensive vision of Christianity and politics. What it is is a sustained reflection on one statement Jesus made that has massive implications for our understanding of Christianity and politics. Um, his statement was, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God's. Uh, so in light of this election season, we want to think well as Christians about what role we have in engaging in politics. Um, and so we care about this um, and so we want to think well about it. Also, if you weren't here last Sunday, uh, we also handed out um, a short uh, little note about how uh, should we engage in politics as Christians. So this is a little bit broader, but also pretty short, um, about five uh, things for us to think about as Christians who engage in politics. So if you weren't here, there's copies of this at the Resource Center as well, so just stop by and that's on the uh, table back there so you can grab that before you leave. Uh, so, one reason to do this is because many Christians uh, today, and you've probably noticed this, um, like so many things in life, we tend to move in extremes. Uh, and we can either tend to make too much of our political engagement in our current moment in America um, and make our engagement in politics or the hope we have in this of ultimate significance. Others can take the other extreme partly in a reaction to that and then uh, think that it has no importance and that this is not important at all, and, at all, and we can ignore this completely. Uh, um, but the Bible actually gives us a fuller vision. Uh, Jesus is relevant to every aspect of life, and the central commands in the Bible are for us to love God with all our hearts and our neighbor as ourselves. And politics is one way that we as Christians together think through how do we love our neighbors as ourselves, the most vulnerable, neighbors in the womb, those who are uh, not getting access to things they need. So we, we think through how we live together as an act of love. And so we want wisdom uh, to do that as well. So we encourage you to think well um, and talk together about how we can do this well um, as Christians. And so those resources are there uh, to help you with that. Uh, let's now uh, pray before we uh, read God's Word. Father, we thank you for this day and this gathering and this moment to hear from your word. Uh, we know that your voice in scripture, your word is true and faithful and enduring and powerful. So we pray that you would rearrange our thoughts and affections, uh, reorder our loves this morning so we'd see reality more clearly and live more faithfully pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 Peter chapter 2, we're looking at verses 4 through 8 now as we move through this letter in these months. So chapter 2 beginning in verse 4, as you come to Him, that is, as you come to Jesus in faith continually as a Christian, a living stone rejected by men but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in Him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Well, many people think that Christianity is something that you can compartmentalize. Many think it means you add certain ideas 
to your mind and the way you think. So you now believe in God's existence and that Jesus died and rose again and is returning someday and we have the forgiveness of sins through him and so forth. And then you also add some practices to your life. Uh, Maybe attend church, read the Bible, pray. If you do this, if you think of Christianity as just kind of adding a few things to your mind and life, you live with uh, a sacred and secular divide. So you have a secular life, beliefs, and activities, and then you open up some space in your life for the sacred. You fit Christianity into pockets of your life as you have time. Being a Christian gets reduced in some cases to Sunday mornings and mealtime prayers. But the early Christians did not reduce their faith to this. Uh, The apostles viewed all of life differently. Their whole outlook on life and way of living was radically and permanently changed. So how do we explain what happened to them and what we may be missing today? Well, one way to understand this is that they used what we can call a sanctified imagination to see reality differently and actually more truly. Using our imagination doesn't mean that we believe things that aren't true. It means that you use your mental faculties to see reality from a new angle. So why do you think the cultural revolution that we're living in is so powerful? It is not mainly because of the power of arguments. People are not typically reasoning their way to new radical ideas of gender and sexuality and how we understand the unborn. It's because of the power of the imagination. Through shows and songs and stories and slogans, they have a new way of seeing reality. And they perceive in this new way of seeing reality a sense of beauty. And and with this new way, things fit together in in a way that makes sense to them now. Well, something similar happened with the early Christians and needs to happen and keep happening to us. They perceived the beauty of Jesus, and they perceived beauty in the way that he was working in the world. Their their imaginations were inflamed to see reality for what it was, and it changed their lives. They used their sanctified imaginations to understand their new identity and their new purpose in light of Jesus. So in our text today that we just read, Peter leads us to use our sanctified imaginations to understand reality clearly. He says that we are a temple and a priesthood, and we offer spiritual sacrifices. Now, that may not sound very compelling to you at first, but what Peter is saying here has the power to change our whole view of Life. So I want to prove that to you from this text and through the course of this. Hope that our imaginations are opened up to see reality differently in light of this. So three realities here. We're a new temple, a holy priesthood, and we offer spiritual sacrifices. So first of all, we're a new temple. Peter says that Jesus is the cornerstone of a new temple, and Christians are the rest of the stones in this new temple building, this temple. So if you are a Christian, you are part of this temple. If you are not yet a Christian, you are invited to become part of a temple. What is going on with this? Well, Peter says, first of all, that Jesus is a stone. It's a metaphor, of course. Notice what he says in in the beginning here. He says, he's a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Now, why does he call Jesus a rejected and living stone? Well, Peter's drawing on the Old Testament here. There are three texts in the Old Testament that refer to a person as a stone. They were all viewed by many Jewish people as messianic, meaning that they were anticipating the coming king or Messiah, Savior. Peter, in the text we just read, quotes all three of them, saying they refer to Jesus. And the most significant one for Peter's point here is Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is about the king of Israel who had just won a battle. He then returned to Jerusalem and the temple to celebrate the victory. And in Psalm 118.22, this king says this about himself, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Do you know what a cornerstone is? 
It was that first stone laid in a building project, and it had to be perfectly cut because the rest of the building went out from it. Its edges set the trajectory of the sides of the building. So once you laid a perfectly cut cornerstone, you know the rest of that building will be level and plumb. The king in this psalm is saying, I was rejected as unworthy, but I've become the cornerstone. Jesus quoted this text to refer to himself. In his final week, Jesus came into Jerusalem, entered the temple, just like that king in Psalm 118, and then in the temple, the Jewish leaders were rejecting him, looking to kill him. So he told them a story. He said that they are like tenants that a master um, gave a land to and his land to, to care for it, put in charge of it. And these tenants keep rejecting the servants that the master sends to check on them. And they eventually reject the master's son and kill him. Jesus was telling them what they were about to do to him. He's the son of God. Their ancestors had rejected prophet after prophet after prophet, and now they're going to kill God's own son. And he capped off the story by quoting Psalm 118. He said, this is Mark 12, 10, have you not read in Scripture the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? He was saying, you are about to kill me, but I will rise and I will be the cornerstone of a new building. Peter learned this from Jesus, and so in the early days of the church, Peter confronted the people of Israel for rejecting Jesus, and Peter had, at one occasion in Acts chapter 4, he had just healed a man, and then he tells them about Jesus, and he said this, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become, right now that he's risen from the dead, he's become the cornerstone, and there's salvation in no one else, for there's no one name under, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And then now in our text this morning, Peter brings this teaching to these Christians. Jesus was rejected, but he's, he rose and he's become the cornerstone. So what are the other stones then that make up the rest of the building and what kind of building is this? Well, do you see what Peter says here? It's you who trust and follow Jesus. He says in verse 5, as you come to Jesus as the living stone, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. So the building is a spiritual house. It's a way of referring to a temple. Jesus is the cornerstone. Christians are the rest of the stones. And Peter is saying then there is a, there's a new temple made up of Jesus and his people. Now you could read this and think, okay, uh, that's a nice image for Christians. We're like a temple. We kind of fit together. We're connected. Nice image. Community matters. Make sure that you have Christians in your life because you're like a building. But if that's all we think, as true as that is, is if that's all we think, that's like having a fork full of stuffing and thinking we've just had the Thanksgiving meal. Or it's like watching the opening tip off and thinking we just watched the whole game. What Peter says is much bigger than this, and it can change your own self-identity and outlook on life. But the only way we'll see this is if we understand the backdrop that Peter's drawing on here. So do you know the story of God's presence through the Old Testament? Here's a brief summary of God's presence in, in the temple in the Old Testament. The story began in Eden. Many scholars have shown that Eden was, in some sense, the first temple. Uh, more accurately, what's going on is that all the later, the later tabernacle and temple in the Old Testament were modeled after Eden because Eden was the ideal world. It was the sacred space where heaven and earth merged and God's presence was with Adam and Eve. But when Adam and Eve sinned, God sent them out of the garden and then he guarded that sacred space with these angelic guards called cherubim. And then outside of Eden, God occasionally showed up to people again. And there were little episodes of God dwelling again with people. So, In Genesis 28, for instance, Jacob had a dream, and he saw a ladder 
It was probably the stairs of a ziggurat, like an ancient temple structure. And these stairs were understood to ascend to heaven, so heaven could also descend to us. It creates an access point between heaven and earth like Eden. And Jacob in his dream saw angels ascending and descending on this ladder or staircase. And then God came and spoke to him. So when he woke up, he called the place the house of God and the gate of heaven. God later brought Israel out of Egypt and had them build a tabernacle, and, which is a, a portable tent to contain God's presence. And one of the most striking aspects of the tabernacle that we saw uh, many times as we went through the book of Leviticus um, last year is that it is a mini symbol laden Eden. God's presence dwelt there in a special way. And as priests entered, they were like a symbolic humanity or Adam re-entering Eden and God's presence. There were even cherubim, those guardians of the way back to Eden, cherubim stitched on the entrances so that as the priest entered, it was like re-entering Eden with God's presence again. And then when Israel entered Canaan, Solomon built a temple, a more permanent tabernacle, and he filled it with Edenic imagery, open flowers and trees and cherubim all over the inside. And God's presence dwelt there. So this is an Eden-like merging of heaven and earth. But then the same thing happened to Israel that happened to Adam and Eve. They continually rejected God, and so God's presence left the temple. Israel was taken out of the land, like Adam and Eve were sent out of Eden. And so the prophets started anticipating the restoration of God's presence, and they spoke about it in different ways. Sometimes, like Ezekiel, they talked as though a new temple would be built. But when we read it carefully, it's filled with symbolism, pointing beyond itself to some greater reality. And then Jesus came. And when he came, the physical temple in Jerusalem was not functioning as it should have. We never hear of God's presence returning to it. One of the most radical things Jesus ever said was to refer to himself as the temple. So he said, on one occasion when he was in the temple, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? And then John, who's reporting this story, said that Jesus was referring to the temple of his own body. And then now we look ahead to the new creation to come. The Bible wraps up with Revelation 21 and 22, describing the new earth, the new creation in symbol-laden ways, like a new temple. It's a symbolic vision portraying this city of New Jerusalem coming down like a perfect cube. It doesn't mean that there will be a New Jerusalem that will be cube-shaped coming. This is a symbol-laden vision, and it's communicating something. There's only one other perfect cube in the Bible, and it's the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle and temple. So the Bible ends by saying that we will live in a new earth again, where as Revelation says, God and the Lamb, Jesus, are the temple, and this whole new city we'll be in is the Holy of Holies. Revelation 21 verse 3 says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Bible ending how it began. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, And God himself will be with them as their God. So that is the story of God's presence through the Bible. From Eden to the tabernacle to the temple to Jesus to the new creation to come. Now I left out one part of the story. Did you notice what part that was? The part that we're living in right now. So in light of this big story, do you see how radical it is when Peter says that Jesus and his people are a new temple? This way of understanding the church is common throughout the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? 2 Corinthians 6.16, we are the temple of the living God. Ephesians chapter 2, we are built on the foundation, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows, the church, God's people, grows into a holy temple to the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, a problem at this point is that some could hear this and think, and I did for many years, interesting metaphor, 
the church is like a temple. But this is not saying that the church is like a temple. Peter is saying that we are a temple. And in light of the storyline of the Bible, Jesus and his people are not just a temple, we are the temple. So we are a new temple. And then Peter expands on this imagery, mixes his metaphors a bit, and says we're also a holy priesthood. In verse 5, he calls us living stones built up as a spiritual house, and then he gives the purpose of this. So this is our second observation, our second reality to see ourselves not just as a holy, uh, the new temple, but as a holy priesthood. He says that we're built up this way so that we will be a holy priesthood. Now, mixing images is not a problem. It's the nature of the fulfillment of the Old Testament in Jesus and his people. Jesus is the true temple and the great high priest. So when we're united to him by faith as Christians, we become part of the temple and priests. And like the story of God's presence through the Old Testament, we won't grasp the significance of this imagery here without the Old Testament story of priesthood. Uh, We'll be much briefer this time. Peter brings this up again in verse 9, which we'll return to in a couple weeks. But here's a 20-second summary. Adam, our first human, was the first priest. He was a priest in Eden. He was placed in God's presence, in this temple-like presence of Eden, to worship him and to obey him and to teach his word. And when God then later would give Israel the tabernacle and temple, he also appointed priests to offer sacrifices, to worship, and to teach God's word. And then Jesus came as the great high priest who offered himself as the final sacrifice for sins, and now we are united to him by faith, and we become priests. We're restored to this priestly role of Adam and humanity from the beginning. So this is where the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers comes from. So we'll spend more time on that in a couple weeks as Peter brings it up again. But for now, the main point is, if you are a Christian, you are a priest. This is to be part of your self-understanding. And the church together is therefore a priesthood. We have direct access to God's presence. The best part of Eden is restored. God is with us and we can serve and worship Him. So what does this mean for us? Well, this is what we see next. Being a priesthood gives us a new purpose for our lives. So third, here's our purpose. We offer spiritual sacrifices. So we are a new temple, Peter says, in order to be a new priesthood that lives out this new purpose In verse 5, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, this is a new, dignified, whole life-encompassing purpose available to you. We are still here in the imagery of a temple with priests. So now we're a new temple. We're filled with God's Spirit's presence. And now as priests in the temple, we have a role to play. And that's to offer sacrifices. Now, what are those sacrifices? Peter doesn't expand on it here, but other New Testament authors fill this out for us, and we can see in the rest of Peter's letter, as we'll see in coming weeks, what this looks like. And Peter and the rest of the New Testament show us that our sacrifices are made and can be made in every aspect of life. In fact, we are to offer our whole self as a sacrifice to God's service. Romans 12, 2 says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So you are now a priest to offer a sacrifice. So what do you offer? Your whole self in all of life. It's not limited. Here's how one author summarized what Peter has in mind here by considering the rest of his letter. This is what it means to live with a new purpose of offering sacrifices. He said, to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ then is to offer one's whole life, body, soul, mind, and strength, blood, sweat, and tears, work, rest, and play in complete devotion to the glory of God. There could be no more sweeping or dignifying purpose than this. It dignifies every part of life. It means that your vocational life, if you have a job or a career, it is not a waste of time. You don't need to just endure until retirement. You don't need to live for the weekend. 
You don't need to just work for a paycheck. You can work in a way that honors God, and you can sacrifice in a way that pleases Him. You can serve and bless others through your vocation in ways that bless others for Christ's glory and honor Him. It means that your home life is not secondary to your vocational life either, but it's a primary place to honor God as a priest. So if you are married in the way that you treat and serve your spouse, or if you're a parent, your kids, or your grandkids, in all these ways you can serve and bless them, and as you do it, you can do it as a priest, offering yourself as a blessing to them, sacrificing for them, and offering yourself as a sacrifice, a priest offering a sacrifice to God, and he's accepting this through Jesus. It means that you have a calling as well to help others come to know Jesus who don't know him, and you want them then to become living stones in this new temple and be brought into this new priesthood with a new purpose. And so you honor God as you intentionally seek to expand the temple and see others come to know Jesus both in our area and also in nations far beyond. Although our Sunday gathering, like this morning, is not a temple service, it is still a place where we honor God as priests and how we do it when we come together in this way. So we do this as we engage with our whole self, body, soul, mind, and voice, as we engage our whole self to honor God and encourage and serve other people. So you honor a God, God as a priest as you hear God and listen to His Word. Uh, read and preached, and as you engage with your whole mind and heart and voice when we sing, you're participating as a priest, offering sacrifices of praise to God. It's, it happens when we intentionally join in the prayers from up front. So whenever someone's praying from up front, it's of course not for us to listen to someone else pray in our presence, but it's an invitation for us all to be joining together, united, offering up this prayer to God. And we honor Him with the sacrifices. We die to our preferences and encourage each other and bless others before and after and during the service and then through all of life. All right, so let's step back. And we've already been doing this a bit here in the last few minutes, but consider how this shapes, everything we've seen shapes how we view all of life. So to see how this shapes our lives, we have to use our sanctified imagination. So remember, using our imagination doesn't mean we believe things that are not real and true. Uh, The imagination has gotten a bad rap and has been largely misunderstood. It's actually super important to even understanding how the whole Bible fits together as a unified story. That takes imagination to see how all the parts relate to the whole. The imagination is a gift of God used so that we can not just view life as little disconnected pieces and aspects, but see it all as a unified whole. And when we do that, we then can see how all of life can be dignified and have great meaning and be offered up as a sacrifice to God. So Peter tells us then that we need to perceive the beauty of what it means to have this new identity and to live this new identity out. He tells us we are a new temple, a new priesthood with new sacrifices. And so now our job is to use our, imagina- our, our sanctified imagination to th- begin to look at every aspect of our life differently in light of this. So this isn't just something we do this morning, it's something that we will continue to do, and I encourage you to continue to do uh, throughout your life, all throughout your days. So how does this change our view of life? Well, here's seven categories of life that are reshaped with this vision of reality. First would be how we understand the Bible. The Old Testament temple was a temporary pointer to the great reality to come. The Old Testament is telling a story of God's presence, and it was anticipating its fulfillment in Jesus and His people, the church, and the new creation to come as our new Eden. What they were all pointing to all along is now being fulfilled. So this is why Jesus said that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. And it was destroyed, as he said, in AD 70. And Jesus gave zero indication that it would ever be built again or need to be built again. There would be no need for a physical temple with priests and sacrifices. Why? 
because he's the cornerstone. And his people are living stones being built into the temple that was always being anticipated in the Old Testament. So, uh, I do think it's misguided to think then that we're still waiting for a physical temple to be rebuilt. That's what a a theological system called dispensationalism has taught, that there's a a future era uh, when a temple is built. Uh, Some would teach that priests are reestablished, sacrifices, animal sacrifices are offered again, but this misses how Jesus and the church right now are fulfilling the prophetic anticipations of a coming temple. To rebuild a physical temple with priests and sacrifices is to rewind the story and continue on as if Jesus never came. So we're to see that the whole movement of the Old Testament is headed toward Jesus and his people as a new temple and a new priesthood. So when when we grasp this identity, we have a new way of seeing the whole Bible and our place within it. Second, this shapes how we understand sacred space. So we don't look to create, as Christians, we don't look to create temples or sacred space now. We don't view a particular place or building as a particularly uniquely sacred location. It doesn't mean that some places can't matter more than others, but we don't need to build temples as Christians. And this is why, as a church, we don't refer to this building as the house of God. We don't refer to this room as a sanctuary. We don't refer to this front as an altar. The temple is Jesus and his people. The house of God are the people of God and the coming new creation, not a building. Third, this all makes sense of the religious impulse in the world. So when we grasp this, this reality and the whole story of the Bible, we then can look out at history and cultures and even our own, and, and it makes sense of a religious impulse that is deep in humanity. Every culture has this religious impulse. Different people group create religions seeking to connect with the divine. They build temples to create sacred space to connect with God or the gods and appoint priests as mediators to help make that connection. Even our secular culture, there are various practices, spiritual practices that are growing in popularity. And we also, at another level, replace God with various celebrities, honoring them at concert venues and arenas that are like temples and worship services. But Christians see how this longing in the human heart, this longing for a connection with the divine is baked into creation. It's baked into humanity. It's what we were made for from the beginning. But the true God has connected with us through Jesus. He welcomes us back into his presence to connect to him through Jesus, which is why Peter said, Jesus is the cornerstone, and there is therefore no salvation in any other name under heaven but by him, because he's the access point to God, because he is the Lord. Fourth, this changes how we view our everyday life and work. If you are a Christian, you are a new temple and a new priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. Our whole life now is lived with God's presence indwelling us as a temple. So every part of life can be offered to God as a spiritual sacrifice. There's no ultimate chasm between the sacred and secular. And this gives incredible dignity to your work. Your vocation can be a place where you are bringing God's presence to the world. It's a place where you serve and show his love and reflect his glory. As you work in accounting or as you change diapers and clean messes or as you run a business, this all matters because it's a way of living in God's presence and loving others. And he sees it and he honors you for it, even if no one else sees and you feel worthless and you feel like it doesn't matter. Living with a sanctified imagine means you see reality actually more clearly than you might feel. You see reality more clearly than other people around you do. You see that what you're doing does matter. It's a sacrifice acceptable to God. Fourth, or was that fourth? Fifth, this changes how we view our own thoughts and actions. If God indwells you as part of his temple, what does that mean for you when you are sinning? Well, this means that you can never ask God to leave you for a few moments while you sin. If you are a Christian, he's always there, 
and you live in his presence and you sin in his presence. So that should be sobering and should come to bear on those moments when we're tempted. Remember that you are part of a temple. God's presence is with you. You can't ask him to look away or leave you for a few moments while you do this. And what wonderful news then as well for us when we do sin, he is always there to take us back so we can turn right to him immediately and he receives us through Jesus because the final sacrifice has been made for our sin. Sixth, this shapes our view of the local church. This is a very communal text. Notice he doesn't say that each Christian is an individual isolated temple. No, we are each stones that are together forming a spiritual house. And although we are each individually priests, he emphasizes that together we are a priesthood. It's a deeply communal reality. So this means that there's no way to live this out ultimately and truly and fully on your own. And uh, I have sometimes to remind us that live streaming is not a substitute for this. So live streaming is a temporary blessing that we can receive as a blessing for when you're sick or when you're unable to get to a gathering, but it's not a replacement. We are meant to be deeply folded into relationships together as a temple. Seventh, this shapes our understanding of our own selves. In verse 7, Peter says that the one who believes in Jesus as the cornerstone will not be put to shame. Then in verse 7, he says, so the honor is for you who believe. So rejecting Jesus, he says here, means that you'll stumble, you, you trip over the stone, you stumble and you'll experience shame at the judgment, eternal shame. But trusting Jesus leads to honor. So God honors you with this privilege of being part of a temple and priesthood. He's fulfilling his purpose that he had from the beginning, from Eden, dwelling with you and giving you a noble calling to please him in all of life. The honor here is probably also the honor that we'll experience at the judgment and forever beyond. In chapter 1, verse 7, Peter said that when Jesus is revealed from heaven, when he returns, our faith as Christians will result in praise and honor and glory. So that is praise and honor and glory we saw when we looked at that text, not toward God first, but directed toward us from him. It's an astonishing reality. So Peter brings this up again. Those who come to Christ will be honored. You have the honor from God. What an encouragement for Christians who live in a culture where it is shameful to be a Christian and to live as a Christian faithfully. That was the first century world that the Christians Peter's writing to lived in, and it's increasingly like our own culture. When you experience shame for being a Christian, when you feel small and overlooked, when you are disparaged, remember this, you are part of God's temple, and the honor is for you. He honors you in the midst of whatever shame you feel. So you may not think you're a very amazing person. Probably in many ways you aren't, neither am I. But you may think that your life and heart are a disaster. You may feel like a spiritual and moral failure. But if you are in Christ, I mean, Peter just says, as we come to him, not as we prove ourselves to him, as we come to him, if you are in Christ, all of this is true of you. You are part of the temple. The cornerstone is the stone that gets the most prominence in this temple. The rest are stones. Not like some of us little pebbles and some of us big ones and gems. We're all together in this. You have God's presence dwelling in you. If you are a Christian, you are quite an amazing human being. Not because of what you are in yourself, but because of who you are in Christ. And this is true of every Christian. Finally, this shapes our view of Jesus. Notice how Peter began in verse 4. He said, as we come to him, we are built up into this temple. We saw last week that our growth as a Christian, Peter says, is like being a baby that is longing for milk to help it grow. 
So just like that, we long for more of Jesus and his word to make us grow. So we keep coming to him, Peter says. We keep being astonished by Jesus. We keep coming back to him if you've drifted. So if you're a Christian, you've come to him, and then maybe you've drifted from him. Maybe you've drifted from him just since last night. Maybe you've drifted from him in a long season of life here. Maybe a little, maybe a lot. Peter knows, and so he says, keep coming to him. Keep returning to him. He will always take a repentant sinner and drifter back. And if you're not a Christian, you are invited to come to him for the first time. Peter said that there really are two responses to Jesus. He says that some believe in him and others reject him. If you reject him, Peter says that Jesus becomes a stone that you trip and stumble over and you stumble and fall, but you don't have to. You can see that God really has given him as a sacrifice for your sins and raised him again. So the stone that you see is not something you stumble over then, but it's Jesus whom you come to and receive as your Savior. So this is a new vision that we use our sanctified imagination to see and see with and through. It's a new vision of our identity and purpose. So as we live together with sanctified imaginations, we learn to see every aspect of life in light of this reality and everything changes. So I encourage you this week, just pick different times and different activities of your life to think about and say, how does this moment change my life given that I have come to Jesus and I'm part of this temple and I'm a priest, part of a priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifice right now? Lord, help, you pray, Lord, help give me a, a sanctified imagination to see reality here. Right again, this isn't just like a nice metaphor and image to make some interesting connections to the Christian life. This is reality, but we need the Spirit to help us see it and live in light of it. So let me just end with this. Here, here's the result of all this in our lives could look something like this in some moment. Someone asks you about what they see in you, maybe as a change, maybe over time, about a clear sense of purpose and how you treat people with dignity and the way you find joy in the midst of suffering and have energy to serve people and are even honest when you fail. And then you can say something like this. They ask you, what's going on? Tell me about your life. You can say something like this. Well, my answer may sound a little strange, a little crazy and weird at first, uh, but it's this. I believe that I am part of a temple and I am a priest as part of a priesthood and so I view every moment of life as an opportunity to offer a sacrifice, a spiritual sacrifice to God. You mind if I explain that to you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for making this world way more amazing and intriguing than we would ever think if you've not told us. We thank you for the beauties that we see with our eyes in this world, and we thank you for the beauties we've considered this morning that we can see with the eyes of faith and as you transform our imagination to see reality as you see it. So we pray that you would help us as a church family to live together as a spiritual house, we pray that you would give us a deep sense of our purpose and calling as a priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. We pray that many here would have a transformed moment this morning to where all of life looks different now and that this would give them fresh motivation and joy and praise to you as they live in their lives and in their callings, especially the places where they feel most ashamed or most overlooked in life. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.